All right, we're recording. I see Sybil is online. So here's what I have so far, just so I can say it out loud and have it recorded, just in case these other two technologies fail. Sybil is online. Midkiff is here. Rice is here. Richardson is online. Burdett is online. Hudson is here. Tudor is here. Asbury is here. Redmond is online. Michaela's here. Kinsey's here. And that's what we have so far. And Bowers is online. So it was a smart thing to do to be online, I guess, since it was because of the tornadoes. I was looking at my Facebook memories today, and I guess this. Really bad storms in Nashville. Hurricane or that tornado that went through. But of course, they're probably trying. But Oh, uh, yeah, very rarely, but sometimes. There's right after the Patrick Street exit, there's a car accident, yeah. and it's the tiniest little thing to do. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going on there. It's cops, they have it shut down, they have ambulances. I'm like, oh, wow. It would be like a scratch in the car. Luckily, I was going the other way, so I was like, yeah, well, I'll deal with Get her. Eric's online. On this? Yeah. No, what did it say? What did I miss? It said skipper. Skipper? All right, let me see. Hodges is online. Oh. <laughs> Virtual trash talking. Hodges online. Got it. All right. We have less than a minute before we start. Does anybody else have announcements that you want to tell everybody? No? Okay. <laughs> well, then I guess I'll start announcements and reminders. Same old stuff. Uh, you know, do independent work. All right. I guess the best thing to say is just read the announcements because everything... I always say is always in the announcements and I love it. I'm so happy that some people start to figure out what's going on and like, Oh my God, I'm behind in this. I had no idea. Which sucks. You might think, well, a little bit late, but it's only not even halfway through. So it's good that people are realizing what they're missing. But if you read those announcements, like everything that you need to know is in the announcements, all the reminders. So read the announcements. Plus, like I said, there's a lot of independent work points out there or there were every time it expires, it expires, but, you know, there's, I think, at least 14 points that people have missed out on, some people. So read the announcements, reply to them if, uh, if you need to. I see Newton's online. Yeah. Yay, good. Questions are good. The very first thing on our new platform, extra credit, independent work, bring in crush cans and hold back crush cans. I have a full bag of crush cans, crush the way you said, Anytime. Yeah, you can bring the cans anytime. Okay. Awesome. And make sure they're full. Sorry, Bill, before you ask the next question. Somebody else did that. And thank you. you. You know who you are. And you got full credit. But make sure the bag is full, full. The one, maybe I'll bring it in. I haven't brought it home yet. It's not that full, which is bad because if it's not very full, it would go flying out the back of my truck. And I don't want to put it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Burst. Oh, no, not anymore. That's already done. I had enough votes and we had, I had to make a call. So that's 
a good segue into my next announcement, which is that the exam will be on Wednesday. Exam will be on Wednesday. Of course, if you want to take it earlier, you can. You will just, you know, let me know and we'll find the time to do it. Um, it's just going to be like the last one was. It'll be online. You don't need to come in. You log in. Check, keep an eye on your email. It'll post sometime before 8 o'clock. And you can start as early as you want. As soon as you see it, make sure you hit the submit button by 8.50. You'll lose a point for every, or 10 points for every minute that you're late. Or 10%. For, yeah, 10 points for every minute that you're late. Um, of course, nobody messed that up last, on the first exam. I was really excited. It's the first semester where no one's messed that up. Of course, like I have every semester, people say, oh, I slipped in. Or I didn't know that was the exam. Which, that's unacceptable. Because I'm telling you now, I put it in writing. I'm going to keep telling you. The exam is on Wednesday, on Wednesday at 8 o'clock. Um, just like last time, if you'd rather take a paper version, let me know beforehand and you can come in. I can physically give you one you can fill out uh, that way. And if you want more time to take it, if 50 minutes is not enough for you, then find it, then talk to me. We'll schedule a time to meet online where I can see you and I can see your screen and I can hear you. And as long as I know you're taking a closed book exam, you can take as much time as you want. So keep those things in mind. And again, the, um, the exam review. I don't know when it's going to be yet. I'll let you guys know. It won't be during class time. I'll find a time outside of exam, uh, outside of class time to do it. But if I remember correctly, I'm going to watch the video to be sure. That video I've already posted to the exam review, I think it covered everything. Because as far as the review is concerned, this exam is easy because it's the one study guide for Chapter 5. And that Chapter 6 slash 7 study guide, it's like straight to the point. There is no garbage. It's all like this is going to be on the test. You know what I mean? Like the ones where they're multiple choice. There's a bunch of stuff where I'm like, yeah, that probably won't be on the exam. This might be on the exam. The one for the chapter six and seven study guide, every single one of those questions will be on the exam in one form or the other. So anyway, I'll watch that video and let you guys know. The whole extra credit thing that I keep hinting around about, that should already be on the video. So any questions? Good? All right, so again, another good segue to remind you this exam that we're about to take on Wednesday is chapters five, six, and seven. It's all about energy transformation, right? One of those properties of life. Life needs energy, and we have to transform it from one form to another. That's basically what chapter or exam two is about. Now, what we're about to cover is new stuff. We're talking about chapter eight, but it will not be on this exam that you're taking on Wednesday. And I don't like it to be tricky, but at least when I am tricky, I'll go ahead and tell you I'm being tricky. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you there's going to be some questions some, not questions, some of the choices for the multiple choice exam that you take on Wednesday that are going to include some answers from chapter eight. And I'm telling you now, those are not the right answers because uh, chapter eight's not going to be in the exam. So when you see anything to do with cellular reproduction or mitosis or meiosis, just know that's the wrong answer. And I'm putting it there to see who's paying attention. Because it's very easy to log in or come to class and not pay attention. I do it all the time when I'm in meetings. I try to pay attention, but if it's not concerning me, my brain goes elsewhere. So I don't say that in a judgmental way. I'm just saying I know human nature. Anyway, have there any questions before we jump into the material that will be on exam three? All right, let's do it. Chapter eight. And we're still at the cellular level. So, so as boring as this may be, this again, without this, we just wouldn't have life. And that's why you're learning about it. We'll start with a little guessing game. How about this? Does anybody know what these things are? Not that I expect you to. I'm just curious to see if anyone does. That's a great guess. It kind of looks like bacteria. What, what was it? Yeah, those are chromosomes. And yeah, if you said bacteria, don't feel bad. I mean, those look just like bacteria. But yeah, those happen to be chromosomes. And if I, I'm looking at this correctly, there's a problem. Well, I won't even say that. But um, there is an extra chromosome, if I'm looking at that um, correctly. If those are supposed to be two pairs of chromosomes and there's an extra. So in this chapter, you're going to learn about some of those diseases that are caused by extra chromosomes, like Down syndrome, for example. Um, that would be the big one we talk about, but there's others. Not that that's important for the grand scheme of the semester or the exam, but it's kind of interesting stuff. Uh, this one's a little bit harder to guess. Obviously, that's like an X-ray or something, right? I'm showing you a little bit of something. Any guesses what that might be? Again, not that I expect anybody to be able to guess, but curious to see if anybody does know. That would make sense, especially considering it's in the lungs. But it's a tumor, so it's cancer. 
And in this chapter, and this is, in my opinion, makes this chapter a very, 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 very relevant chapter, probably one of the most relevant that we've done so far, other than the prerequisite chapters that gave you the knowledge that you need to understand this one. This is really important. You need to know about cancer. Now, granted, by the end, we're only going to scratch the surface. So I'm going to really, really teach you about cancer, but you're going to learn the basics of it. So if you ever come down with cancer or somebody you love, and then you have to start doing research and understanding what kind of cancer they have and how, how it works and how it's caused and how it's treated, then you're going to need to know this basics, right? So I'm giving you the basics now, a good foundation. So God forbid you ever need to learn. Here we got this lady. Uh, we're kind of zooming into her arm for whatever reason. We're looking at a cell, and inside the cell, we're looking at the nucleus and looking at the DNA, and we're zooming in on it. Any guesses what your book is? This is so wild. I mean, it could be a million things, but you might want to venture a guess as what your book's getting at right there. That's okay. I think, if I remember correctly, what your book is getting at, that if you were to take one cell out of your body, take one of the chromosomes out of there and stretch it out, it would be longer than you, depending on how tall you are. So I assume she might be kind of short, so it'd probably be longer than her. It... Slightly interesting stuff. Um, let's move forward. Every chapter starts with this, biology and society. I'm going to skip it because it's not important. It's interesting, but it's not important. Of course, that's why they always start it with this, because it is interesting. But you can look into it if you want. There's stuff like this in the news. Maybe not the news, but you'll see it. An animal without having been, or a female, would give birth to another animal or eggs without ever, ever having been exposed to a male. And that's something called parthenogenesis. You can look into it. It's really interesting. How many of you have seen the original Jurassic Park? All right, so remember that, you know, they're like, oh, they're all females. They won't breed. But they didn't know <laughs> Parthen Parth parthenogenesis is a thing, and that's exactly what happened. So even though they were, uh, they were all females, life finds a way. Anyway, look into it if you want. It's really good, I think, interesting um, in the independent work topics. Right? You can look into all the different kinds. It's not always just a shark. right? It's happened in other species. So you can look into that. Also, while we're on the subject, because this whole subject, this whole chapter is basically about sex. At the cellular level, right? So just like the last, the one of the last chapters was breathing, but at the cellular level, this is about sex at the cellular level. And especially right now with all the things going on in um, society, it is interesting, right? What's the difference between sex and gender? Because one of those things is a scientific thing. One of those things is more of a social science thing. Also, how do you define a male and a female? I'm going to teach you that. For humans, it seems straightforward. Two X's and you're a female and an X and a Y, you're a male scientifically but then there's exceptions to those rules and then that's just humans then you can look at other animals uh and other yeah other animals it's very interesting actually not just animals either fungi they're really interesting they have more than two sexes there's some animals that change sexes like they'll be born a female uh, or male and they're just like a bunch of males i think and then when the the, the head female dies and one of them takes their place and becomes a female then there's two worms where they when they mate they stab each other where the penis is and whoever gets the best stab in and injects their semen that's then the male and then the you know obviously whoever got the semen is then the female wild stuff nature has a lot of wild <laughs> sex wait what happened you don't have to go to what is that red tube or whatever that's called for the wild sex on the internet anyway let's jump into it finally wasted enough time hopefully some people will logged on the first word for attendance will be hmm since we're talking about it, let's just say sex. This is one. That should be written here. Man, this should be going in and out, bro. You can send a picture of me, uh, a screenshot of me pointing at that for, for your word. Hopefully, though, I'll have questions this time instead of just keywords. But anyway, if you're in person, send the word sex. If you're watching live right now, send the word sex before 9 a.m. First thing we're talking about is what cell reproduction accomplishes, right? Then we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of uh, cell cycle and mitosis. Then we're going to talk about the other version of cellular reproduction, which is mitosis. So that's it, basically. So this is the mitosis. That's the gist of it. 
So again, just like I recommended studying for the last chapters, I recommend studying for this chapter here. Look at the big picture, memorize that, and start adding details. So there's the big first thing to remember, right? We are talking about cellular reproduction or meiosis. And now we'll start adding some details. All right. You would probably think it's this bullet point, right? The birth of a new organism. Like, actually, I should have asked that before I went here. Here, I know you've just read it, but let me ask you, how many of you have reproduced? Nobody's raising their hands. So none of you have kids. And again, that is what most people think, right? Because that would be this bullet point. But you have reproduced. You're reproducing right now. As you're sitting here, you're reproducing because more often than not, it's not a new organism is what reproduction is. It is the production of new cells. And honestly, that's what we're going to focus on. Even when we do talk about the first bullet point here, this one, even when we do talk about that, we're still talking about it at the cellular level, and we don't actually get to the birth of a new organism. We talk about how to make sperm and how to make egg and what happens when it combines, barely. But that's it. We don't talk about pregnancy or any of that. Birth, right? This is just at the cellular level. So cells undergo something, uh, reproduction, which is what this whole chapter is about. We call that cell division. And in that process, you know what? I'm going to skip that part for now because we're going to come back to this. And again, there are exceptions to this rule. So let's just focus on this bullet point, which is the fact that cells undergo reproduction called cell division. Um, I don't know. I, I'll stick with it. I'm sorry. I'll stick with it because this is the way your book does it. It's the way your book introdu introduces it. So in cell division, what you do is you start with one cell and then you produce two daughter cells. And you need to know these words, not because I'm going to test you on it, but I'm really going to use that word a lot. Daughter cell is a word I'm going to use a lot. But if you've done the pre-lab for next week, you probably already know this. But anyway, in this type of cell division that produces two daughter cells, they are identical, right? They're identical to each other, and they're identical to the parent cell. And that's in parentheses because... cell and then right you have if you will and you're left with two cells and we'll talk about this in much more detail as we move forward so I'm not gonna take questions yet um, save this. We're going to talk about this in more detail later. So this is still an introduction. But before we can do that cellular division, where that one cell can split into two, we have to duplicate the chromosomes. Actually, we have to duplicate everything, right? Because imagine you have this one cell and you're about to make two. So everything in the cell needs to duplicate. But the reason your book is pointing out the fact that we need to duplicate the chromosomes, because that's mostly what we're concerned with for this chapter. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the cells when they reproduce, but we are mostly just focused on the chromosomes. So keep that in mind too. As we're as you're learning this, it's all about the chromosomes, which is a decent independent work topic. It might be a little over your head, so it might not be that interesting because of that. But again, I'm going to teach you what happens to the chromosomes when cells divide, and you could look into other stuff. Like what about every other thing we talk about? What about the plant cells with their chloroplasts? which we learned about for respir or photosynthesis. What about any eukaryotic cell in the mitochondria, which we learned about for respiration, right? How do those things get ready to duplicate? And all the other stuff we skipped from chapter four. The smooth ER, the rough ER, lysosomes, all the parts, what happens to them? Anyway, with cell division, each of the daughter cell receives one identical set of chromosomes from that original parent cell. So basically this slide is repeating what the last slide said, except now it's just focusing on the chromosomes. Because remember the last slide said you end up, you start with one cell, you end up with two daughter cells and they're genetically identical. We're basically saying the same thing here. Now we're just saying it in a different way. We're focusing on the chromosomes. So as you're sitting here right now, you're doing this, right? You have cells doing this and they're making perfect little copies of each other. Chromosomes, so in each one of those chromosomes is making a perfect little copy. Any questions so far? 
Okay. Cell division plays roles in the lives of organisms. Obviously, I've been saying this since we started this, uh, what, 15 minutes ago, right? So this is important because this is one of those properties of life. That's why you're learning about it. So again, as boring as it may be, it's literally, you know, why we're here. So that's why you're learning about it. Plus, like I said, this is the basis of uh, cancer. To understand cancer, because cancer is when this goes wrong, right? So to understand that, you need to understand how this is supposed to work. But anyway, like I've already kind of hinted at, in your life or any other organism, this cellular reproduction replaces damaged or lost cells. So when I said right now, as you're sitting here, you're reproducing, that's probably why you probably have damaged or lost cells. Um, possibly, it's possible that you're still growing. It's a decent independent work topic. Not really important for, uh, for this semester, but you could look into that. When, when do people typically stop growing? It's different for males or females, and it's also not always the same. So when do the typical people typically quit growing? Um, and are there certain parts? Like, if you're, does your height quit before your, I don't know, your weight? I don't know. You can look into, the, into that. And then anyway, also, the third bullet point, reproduction, right? So those are the three reasons that we do cellular reproduction. Replace lost or damaged cells to grow into for humans, right, making a baby. Any questions about this? All right. Also, and I, let me back up and rephrase that. So for us, that reproduction, that's what I mean, right? Making a baby, because we need to make sperm or egg, depending on who you are. But also, there are other organisms that are single-celled, right? So for them, when you split a cell, that is reproduction. That is a new organism, so to speak. So yes, two types of reproduction, which we'll cover as we move forward. Any questions about this slide? Here's some pictures of what I'm talking about. Here's a human kidney cell. You can't tell it yet, but hopefully by the end of this chapter and by the end of the lab, you can look at this and say, oh, yeah, I can tell what's going on there. But what's happened, and you can see this kind of looks like one cell, but there's kind of a, a line in the middle because that cell is in the middle of splitting off. It's in the middle of turning into two cells. Here's an early human embryo. Um, you start off, as I'm sure you know, once the sperm meets the egg, at that point, you are that one cell. And then you are two cells, and then you're four cells, and then you're eight, 16, 64, 128. That's, you just keep doubling, right? That's how the growth works. Um, right here, I'm going to give you some examples of this. Like I said earlier, if you're a single-celled organism and you are splitting into two cells, then that is your reproduction, right? That is, your, that is creating a new organism, so to speak. And then here's the stuff I find really interesting. It's not important for this semester at all, but really interesting. Sometimes, like, you can cut off, and sea star is just one animal that does it. If you cut off the arm of a sea star, it'll grow, it'll grow a new arm. And also, the arm will grow a new sea star. It's really cool stuff, and that's, a, to me, an interesting independent work topic. What are some other animals that do that? Or you could write about it, too. Like, cut a lizard, lizard's tail off, it'll grow back. You take a sponge and squish it through, like, a sieve or um, a colander, so we have just had like thousands of pieces of sponge now. Each one of those little thousands of pieces of sponge will grow into a whole new sponge, or whichever one survives. And then this is the one that's relevant for me in my everyday life, is growth of clippings. So, you know, when you buy fresh herbs at Kroger, a lot of times you can keep them in water, and then they'll grow some roots, and then you can, uh, you know, grow a new plant. So, which would be a clone from the original plant, right? Because you took a piece of that plant and then uh, made it into a whole new organism. Anyway. Nothing to study here. There won't be any questions about this. This is just a good um, introduction. Anyway, any questions about this? Natural reproduction. So there's two different types of reproduction. You need to know them both. You need to know the differences between the two of them, the similarities between the two of them, um, what they're used for, what kind of organisms do them. So let's jump into it. The first one we're going to talk about is asexual reproduction. Asexual, as in not sexual, right? This requires no egg or sperm. This is when the parent and the offspring have identical genes. So what I taught you earlier, up again. So when you have two daughter cells that are identical to the parent, that is asexual reproduction. So it's not always like that, because then there's sexual, which we'll talk about later. 
Um, this is how single-celled organisms reproduce, right? Humans so far cannot reproduce asexually. Thank goodness. This is a man. I'd be very, even more useless. I couldn't at least provide that. Actually, there's probably a lot of sci-fi movies or books along those lines. But also, and here's the part where people mess this up. So I'm going to put a little line right here. Well, nah, not yet. I won't bring that up yet. Anyway, so again, this is how asexual reproduction is how a lot of single-celled organisms reproduce, but also multicellular organisms use asexual reproduction to grow. Like we said about the sea star, right? You cut an arm off, you grow a new one. I don't remember what I put a star for there, so let's not worry about that little star next to the sea stars. And again, like we said, the other example, uh, growing a new plant and flipping. So that's mint. I use mint as an example because I've done that so many times. Cut a little piece off, get some roots, and plant it. But you want to keep it inside because mint is very invasive. Anyway, and I put others there as a question, you know, for independent work topic if you want to look into it. What other things can do that? Like I said earlier, what other things can reproduce asexually from like cutting a chunk off? Anyway, any questions about this slide? All right. So while we're talking about the slide was big enough, this could have been on the same as the last slide because we're still on the same topic. We just ran out of space, so I had to go to a new slide. So under asexual reproduction, we then have something called mitosis. Gotcha. Um, and you know what? I really shouldn't put that bullet point on there now that I'm thinking about it. Because, yes, this point is true. Without the other bullet point, it makes it look like that's all mitosis is for. So just to make sure you understand this correctly, all the stuff on the previous slide about asexual reproduction is still relevant to this, right? We do mitosis for asexual reproduction. So, yes, we use this for the growth and maintenance of multicellular organisms. So right now, as you're sitting here, you're going through mitosis. Um, but also... Single cell organisms use it for reproduction, like right, to make a new, um, a new organism. The next word for attendance or words term will be invasive species, as we have one on the screen right there. Invasive species. Of course, that one's cute and it's inside, so it's all good. It's still an invasive species. All right, we're still going to talk a little bit more about mitosis, but are there any questions so far? All right, so that was asexual reproduction, the introduction, and we're going to come back to it. Now we're going to talk about the opposite, which is sexual reproduction. Remember, there's only two, asexual and sexual, so now we're talking about the other one. So this one, you know, again, it's the opposite, right? So asexual means there's no need for sperm or egg, but sexual reproduction needs sperm and egg, and when you bring them together... So sure you guys know that when you put an egg and a sperm together, it's called fertilization, but I'm probably not even going to ask that on the exam. That's going to be too easy. Of course, that term is going to be used, but here's one you might not know, and you need to know this term. Again, not necessarily because I'm going to ask it, but because I'm going to use it a lot. I might ask, but I don't know. Gamete. All right, so when a gamete is the term that it's what an egg and a sperm is, right? That that one sexually, uh, the one cell that's used for sexual reproduction, it's called a gamete. And the production of those gametes involves a cellular division called meiosis, which only happens in the reproductive organs. So there you go. For the most part, we've talked about the big differences between sexual reproduction and asexual. There's going to be more that we'll talk about later. But again, asexual, no sperm and egg. Sexual, sperm and egg. Asexual, mitosis is the process. Sexual, meiosis is the process. And this is a really stupid way to remember it, but hopefully because it's so stupid, it'll help you remember. All right, so when you have sex, right, for reproduction, not for fun, but when you're having sex, you don't use your toes, right? And I don't care if you're into foot stuff, even if you do incorporate feet into your business, you're not actually doing it for reproductive purposes, right? 
So if you remember, mitosis is asexual, then by process of elimination, meiosis is the other one. So any questions about this so far? Again, we're going to get into more detail for both of them. All right. Um, so now that we know that there's sexual reproduction and asexual, we know the differences between them. Between them, I'm going to take a step back and think about us, right? We are sexually reproducing organisms. Humans are re sexually reproducing organisms. To create a new human, we have to go through sexual reproduction. However, and this is the part that a lot of people forget, even though I've already talked about it a lot, we, even though we do sexual reproduction to create a new life, like a baby, we also still do mitosis. Like I said, as you're sitting here, you're going through mitosis. So keep in mind, when we're talking about sexually reproducing organisms, it isn't as if that's all they do is sexually reproduce. They also live and they grow. Like how many of you have ever had a cut before? All right, is it still an open wound? No, right, because that was maintenance, right? You grew new cells, you closed it up, you healed. How many of you were born this size? None of you, right, because you grew. At one point in your life, you were one cell. None of you, I can tell by looking, are one cell. At least none of you can hear me. Hopefully there's no, like, I never want to get into it. Anyway, any questions about this slide? Okay, here we go. Now we're jumping into the next main bullet point. This is where it gets a little bit more complicated. Now we're going to talk about the cell cycle and then mitosis. Um, and the way your book presents it, really, when you think about it, this, well, you, you'll see it'll make more sense once we jump into it. But the whole cell cycle is basically the life of, of the cell, as you're going to learn. And really, you could talk about that as the cell cycle and mitosis and the cell cycle and meiosis, right? Because it's all mitosis is just a small part of the entire cell cycle. And meiosis is just a small part of the entire cell cycle. In my opinion, this should be taught. The cell cycle should be one bullet point. And then mitosis should be another bullet point, and then meiosis should be another bullet point. But they are squeezing together the cell cycle and mitosis, which shouldn't be too complicated unless you really start thinking about the way they presented it. So just understand what I'm teaching you. Let, let me know if you have any questions. Does anybody remember, because I've only brought it up a few times, what, what do we mean by eukaryotic? Give you some examples okay um let's say if you could see it if they were big enough which would be impossible if i were to hold up a bacteria cell and a fungal cell and i don't know a banana cell which of those would be eukaryotic could be all three could be just one could be two bacteria fungus banana which of those would be eukaryotic fungus would be eukaryotic yeah that's a tougher one and so would a banana, right? So basically, you can all right. So in all of life, there's eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. Basically, prokaryotic cells are bacteria, and basically, eukaryotic cells are everything else. Eukaryotic cells are more complicated. That's why we focus on them. And we are eukaryotes. So we give a lot of attention to it. There's a whole different course for um, prokaryotic cells. Anyway, so that's what we're focusing on, right? We're focusing on eukaryotic cells. We're not talking about bacteria. You can, oh, speaking of which, another good independent work topic. Everything I'm teaching you is going to be about eukaryotic cells. So you can think, all right, well, what's the prokaryotic version of this? Uh, same thing with photosynthesis and respiration, now that I'm thinking about it. So everything I taught you was about eukaryotic cells. Only eukaryotic cells have chloroplasts. Only eukaryotic cells have... To survive how do they make their atp and remember there was also photosynthetic bacteria so how do they photosynthesize without chloroplasts because i told you remember i taught you how it works like you can't the way i taught it you can't do that without the chloroplasts because you got to pump those hydrogen ions against the concentration gradient without a and they get stuck there in between the the the, the membranes of the chloroplast anyway let's move forward for eukaryotic cells, most of the genes are located on chrome, chromosomes inside the nucleus. And as far as we're concerned, that's it, right? We're going to focus on this, the chromosomes inside the nucleus. We're not going to even talk about the other ones. For example, your mitochondria has their own set of chrome, uh, DNA. 
and your book doesn't even get into that. So if you do a 23andMe thing, that's part of how that works. They look at all your uh, deno genomic DNA from your nucleus, but they also look at your mitochondrial DNA, because that only comes from your mom. Not that you need to know that, but it's just interesting to me. So you have a whole set, a whole different set of uh, genes, a whole different set of uh, DNA that only comes from your mom, and that's in your mitochondria. And the same thing can be said for plants with their um, chloroplast. The chloroplast only comes from the female. And it has its own genome. Anyway, let's move forward. So when we're talking about, oh yeah, it's already said that, right? So we've talked about these two, the first two bullet points. Um, each chromosome contains one long DNA molecule that has thousands of genes. I put a little star next to there because that number varies depending on the organism and depending on the chromosome. As you're going to learn later in this chapter, you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So chromosome number one, not that you need to know this, but just so you know, chromosome number one has a number two, I mean, chromosome number two has a Number, oh yeah, number two as well. I was going to say number 22. But that's a good independent work topic, right? How many genes does a typical human genome have, if you want to look into that? How many genes does each chromosome have, if you want to look into that? Or if you have a favorite creature out there, whether it be a plant or an animal or whatever, you could look into that. How many chromosomes does a typical cat have? How many genes does a typical parrot have? Whatever. You can think of all kinds of questions for that. And then finally, the chromosome number, like I was kind of hinting at, um, it depends on the species. So like I said, you guys have 23 pairs of chromosomes. The next slide I'm going to show you illustrates this fact. But before I go to that next slide, does anybody have questions about this slide? All right, here we go. So again, the, the chromosome number is different. Here we are, humans, we have 46 chromosomes. Like I said, 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? So if you have 23 pairs of shoes, you have 46 shoes, right? 23 pairs, 46. Same with the chromosomes. 23 pairs, so you have 46 total chromosomes. You do not need to know this. So do not study this chart. This is not a uh, zoology class, but it is slightly interesting to me. And I especially think it's really interesting that here you have this deer that has the lowest on this chart, right? It has six. And then way up with the highest of 102 is a rat. So size does... I was getting at for this previous side, this is a good springboard for um, independent work topic. Think of whatever you're interested in and look it up. How many chromosomes does blah, blah, blah have? You know, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be animals. It could be plants. Like I did my thesis work on um, watermelon, for example. So whatever you're interested in, how many chromosomes do they have? Anyway, and again, one last time, this will not be on the exam. If I were to give anything for this on the exam, I would give you this exact picture and then just ask you a question about it. Like, how many chromosomes does a bison have? And you just look and say, oh, yeah, it has 60, right? Nothing nothing difficult. It would just be seeing if you can interpret a very basic graph like you probably did in third grade. Anyway, any questions about this? Okay. Whew, now we're getting into some more complicated stuff. Chromosomes are made up of something called chromatin. But um, there it is. So this chromatin is usually thin fibers that are much longer than the nucleus. So again, like that picture showed at the beginning, if you were to stretch it out, right, it's usually about six feet long, two meters long. Um, and you've got that all squeezed into one tiny nucleus. Like if I were to hold up a nucleus, actually I am. <laughs> I'm holding up millions of nuclei right now. You just can't see them, right? Because they're really small. They're in me too. So there's that problem. Um, so they're about, and another thing you might want to know about them is they're about half and half DNA and protein. That's what they're made up of is DNA and protein, and it's about equal parts. So your chromosomes, again, are made up of something called chromatin, and they're about half DNA and half protein. Obviously, it's the DNA we mostly focus on. during sexual reproduction. And then later, we're going to talk about, we're going to kind of get into those chromosomes and look at the DNA and look, what do those genes do? What does DNA do? 
We're going to learn about that. So we're going to focus on the DNA, but yes, it's also proteins because the proteins organize, organize the chromatin. They also help control the activity of genes. So in a sense, and I'm going to talk about this a lot in a later chapter, but in a sense, your genes, right, your DNA, your DNA is just a bunch of, it's just a code. So you can think of it as a, of a book that has a bunch of instructions on how to build stuff. And the proteins, in that case, are the things that kind of organize that book, like the binder. And maybe the little thing that, like a little bookmark. So oh, there's my tab. I'm going to go to there because I need to know how to build this or I need to know how to build that. But that'll be a lot more important later in the semester. For now, we're just, I'm just letting you know, chromatin, chromosomes are made up of chromatin. What is chromatin? It's just basically DNA and protein, and we're going to focus mostly on the DNA later. For now, we're mostly going to focus on the chromosomes. Like I said earlier, a fully extended DNA cell is about six feet long. I'm not going to ask you that. For That is a question in one of your future labs. Not that you need to memorize it because you're going to you're going to read a website and prove that you read the website. That's one of the questions. How many? How long is a typical DNA molecule for a human? About two meters, so a little bit over six feet long. Anyway, I've kind of hinted at this next bullet point too. As your cell prepares to divide, so it's not dividing yet; it's just getting ready for it. There's a few things that happen, and you do not need to write this down yet, because we're going to talk about this in detail. So this is still just an introduction. But the chromosomes need to coil up, because right now they're all kind of loosey-goosey. It looks like a big mess of spaghetti. And again, we'll talk about that later. So before they can divide, they have to uh, coil up. Not only will you need to know that, but you'll need to know when in the cell cycle this happens. Um, and when they coil up, they form these compact structures that could be seen with a microscope. So that very first picture that I showed you at the beginning, and I said, what is this? And somebody guessed bacteria, which is a good guess because it did look just like bacteria. And then I said, those are chromosomes. Those were chromosomes that were, have already coiled up. Because when they're not coiled up, you can't see, oh, there's that chromosome, there's that chromosome, there's that chromosome. It just looks like a big squiggly mess. And uh, the next slide I'll show you will visualize this. But um, yeah, so again, we're going to talk a little bit more about this later. But for now, just keep that in the back of your mind. Usually your chromosomes are all loosey-goosey, so to speak. And then when they're getting ready to divide, they coil up. And we'll talk about why a little bit later. But before I show you the picture of this, are there any questions about this slide? All right. So that's a cell that's not preparing to divide. This is a big squiggly mess, right? It looks like a, it's just hard to see what's what. Here you can see, okay, that's a chromosome. That's a chromosome. Like you might not be able to distinguish this chromosome from that chromosome, but you can see, you know, you can pick, pick out a chromosome. I'm like this, it's really mess. Also, this is an important picture when it comes to lab. Um, so one of the things you're gonna do in this lab next week, or this weekend if you wanna do it early um, and get extra credit or maybe not have to come into lab, whatever the case may be, you're gonna see a picture like this, except it won't be zoomed in. It'll be a bunch of cells and you'll have to say, all right, which one of these is in this stage? Which one of them is in this stage? And you just crop the picture like this to say, all right, let's focus on this cell. This one is the one that's in um, prophase. And you'll learn about that as we move forward. But anyway, so there you go. There's some examples of the chromosomes that have coiled up and some that haven't. Any questions? All right, the next word for attendance, because this kind of looks like this to me, would be sausage. Because this thing almost looks like some sausages. And if you're watching the video, and I don't have questions accompanying the video, then you can take a screenshot of me pointing to these chromosomes and saying sausage. Send me the word sausage, but also a picture, a screenshot of me pointing to those words, or the word chromosomes and those sausage-looking chromosomes themselves. Okay, so again, about equal parts DNA and protein. That DNA is packed into an elaborate multi-level system of coiling and folding. I'm going to put a big question mark next to this because I'm not sure I'm going to ask you. Um, and for the most part, other than one exception, if you were to forget what a histone or a nucleosome is, you should be okay for the entire semester. It's one of those things that's not like cumulative knowledge where you need to understand this to understand what I'm teaching you later. Other than one exception, and we'll know that when we get there. But anyway... 
there's things called histones, there's things called nucleosomes. Histones are the proteins that are used to package the DNA. But like I said, chromatin is half DNA, half protein. Well, I'm just giving you a name for those proteins now. And there's other ones, but for the most part, those proteins are called histones. That's what we use to package the DNA. And I'll show you a picture. It'll make a lot more sense when I show you. And then when we wrap the DNA around those histones, then we have something called a nucleosome. And again, I'll show you a picture. I'll show you what I mean soon. Yeah, I'll just show you the picture before I even take questions because this makes a lot more sense when I show you. So anyway, there's the DNA double helix. You can see we're really zoomed in there. Then we kind of zoom out here. Now we're so zoomed out that the, that DNA double helix just kind of looks like one strand, right? Because we're zoomed too far out to see the individual double helix. But you can see that we have these histones and the DNA wraps around those little balls of protein. And each one of those little balls of protein is called a nucleosome. Or each one of those little balls of uh, DNA wrapped around the protein. Those are called nucleosomes. So see, this makes a lot more sense now, I hope, right? Histones are the little proteins that the DNA wraps around, right? Those are histones. And then when they're wrapped around, I'm trying to think of a good example, like a non-biology example. I can't right now. If I do, I'll share it with you later. If you can think of a good non-biological example, let me know. So yes, those are, those are what histones are. Those are nucleosomes. You probably don't need to know them, but if you do, understand that one's protein and the other one is the DNA wrapped around that protein. All right, any questions? Now we're zoomed out even more. And you don't know. Histones, that's called a nucleosome. And then that itself coils up. So this isn't just some random um, artist rendition, like this is actually how it happens. That coils, right, to kind of make like a rope, if you want to call it that. But then that thing itself has like a little clover leaf shape that just kind of spirals down, right? And that is what makes up the chromosomes. So this all is what happens, right, when they get prepared to duplicate. When the chromosomes prepare to duplicate, that's what happens. They coil up. So basically, we're seeing a picture of them coiled up. And then the next slide will be everything we just looked at in one gigantic picture, right? So at the top, we're zoomed in. At the bottom, we're zoomed out. Right, so we just look closer, 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 and zoom out. And these are actual photographs. So these black and white ones. This is actually what it looks like under a microscope. If it's powerful enough to see it. And then that's what a microscope or a centric good grief. That's what a chromosome looks like if you zoom if you have a microscope close enough to see it like that or powerful enough. Then there's something called a centromere. I haven't introduced you to that yet, so I'll tell you about it later, but just Same thing here. Sister chromatids, I haven't talked to you that yet, but I will. Um, just for now, I'll say this. As this points out, this is a duplicated chromosome. It's already done duplication. So what you have here is there's one chromosome, and there's the other perfect copy of it. So, for example, if that was chromosome number eight of your 23 chromosomes, then here you have the original, and here you have the one that's already been copied, and it's still attached. And you'll learn more about that later. Let's talk about duplicating the chromosomes. I just didn't say it in these words. The DNA has to be copied. So the first time I said that, I think I said the chromosomes have to duplicate. So that's saying the same thing. It's just saying it in different ways, right? The, the, the chromosome has to duplicate. And as we know, chromosomes made up of DNA and protein, right? Chromatin. So what happens is, when I'm saying that the chromosomes have to duplicate, the DNA is duplicating, right? The DNA is copied. We're making perfect copies of the DNA. At least that's the way I'm teaching it. So later you'll learn that there are some exceptions. It's not always perfect, as you might imagine, and that'll be important later. But for now, let's we'll just say that we're making perfect little copies of the DNA. The results of this are that now the chromosome consists of two copies called the sister chromatid, like I just showed you earlier, right? So that's what the chromo sister chromatid is. So right now, actually, almost every time you see pictures of your chromosomes, that's usually what you're actually looking at as sister chromatids. Those little X-looking things, that's usually what you're looking at as a sister chromatid. Those are usually chromosomes that have already duplicated, 
So they've got the, like a little perfect copy of each other and they just haven't split off yet. It would almost be as if humans, if, imagine if humans reproduced by just making a perfect copy. You guys all know what conjoined twins are, right? Used to be called Siamese twins. So imagine like if that's how humans reproduce. Like I'm just sitting here, I'm like, you know what? I need to reproduce. So then I just pop out another human, the perfect copy of me, and we're just like attached to the arm, or maybe at the hip. That'd be better. We're attached, literally attached to the hip. And I just have a new perfect copy of me. Let me just hang around for a while. And eventually we'll get cut across or cut apart. And we'll talk about that later. But that's what the sister chromatin is, right? You've got your original chromosome. It copies itself. It makes a perfect little copy. And then it's still attached for a little bit. And at that point, that one chromosome is then considered sister chromatin, right? Because it's no longer the one chromosome. It's, it's it and a perfect copy of itself. Obviously, if it's a perfect copy, it's going to contain identical genes. So if I have a gene on chromosome number 17 that says, all right, so when I have sister chromatids, if I were to look at the same spot on both of those chromosomes, they would both have the same gene that says, all right, you're going to have a hairy back. Again, like I said, they're joined together. It's kind of like the analogy I said with me producing a Siamese twin or a conjoined twin is the more proper term. Here. And I'll put it next to that only indicating that I'm not going to ask you what a centromere is in the exam, but I will use that word a lot. Because all the action for mitosis and meiosis, I'll go ahead and give you a spoiler alert. What we're going to talk about is what's happening in the chromosomes. They're moving here, and they're moving there, and they're doing this, and they're doing that. And there's things that attach to them that move them around. And they are attached at the centromere, which I haven't taught you yet. Again, this is a spoiler alert. That's why I'm going to be using the word centromere. Because without the centromeres and the things attaching to them, all the stuff that I'm going to teach you that you know, it's all because the things are attaching to the centromere. Any questions about this? Then it duplicates itself because it knows that the whole cell is about to split. And when that happens, each of the new cells, each of the two new cells needs an identical copy of that chromosome. So it goes ahead and makes that identical copy. And those are then called sister chromatids. Oh, yeah. And then later I'll show you what happens after this. So this is, again, just the duplication we're talking about. We haven't even talked about splitting them up yet. Right now they're just duplicated and we have sister chromatids. So any questions so far? All right, so that was duplication. Right? Once the cell actually divides, that's when the sister chromatids separate, obviously, right? If they don't separate when the cell divides, then obviously one cell is going to get two sister, you know, sister chromatids, and the other cell is going to get nothing, right? And that's not what we need. We need one cell to have one chromosome, one cell to have another chromosome. So once those sister chromatids separate, they are then considered full-fledged chromosomes again. So it's all semantics, if you will, right? It's a chromosome, then it duplicates, and it's attached. And at that point, that chromosome is called sister chromatids. But then once you split them up again, they're then called chromosomes again. But again, like I've already said a few times in different ways in this chapter, those chromosomes, they're original, they're identical to the original. And I guess since, uh, hold on. Yeah, the last word for attendance will be this one I'm circling right here. So, you know, normal thing if you're in person or online, if you're watching the video later today, zoom into it, whatever you got to do. Um, and when we get back, we'll talk more about that. You guys have a good weekend. Hey, Professor, make sure to run today. I can see somebody's try. Cedric, I can see you talking because your thing, like, can you hear lights me now? up when you talk. Yeah, like that, but I can't hear you. So um, I'll be on 9 a.m. at the latest for office hours. So if you're asking me something, you can just ask me then. Gotcha.